And if you look at the promotional material for this symposium, uh, there are, we're asked to explore five questions. Has presidency become too powerful? Would the founders approve of today's presidency? Does the presidency threaten our system of checks and balances? To what extent has it contributed to public distrust of government? And do we as Americans rely too much on presidential leadership to solve our problems? And the answers are yes, no, yes, it's complicated, and yes. <laughs> but I can't cover that in 20 minutes. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about a, a few things that I hope you'll find interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Campaign 2008 and what it tells us about how Americans view the presidency. Uh, since I, and, and since I think there are probably uh, more conservatives on average in, in this audience, I, I'd like to say something about the conservative view of the presidency and how that's changed over the years. Uh, and then finally, uh, time permitting, uh, what we can expect from uh, Barack Obama. All right, well, of those uh, five questions, I, I think the, the central one is, do we as Americans rely too much on presidential leadership to solve our problems? Uh, I think it's clear that we do, and I think that that is also the source of much of our dissatisfaction with the modern presidency. We look to the office to solve problems it was never intended to solve, and uh, problems that no single man or woman could solve, problems perhaps that no political institution could solve. And even worse, this tendency to, to uh, expect too much out of political leadership drives the concentration of presidential power. If you expect a man to perform miracles, don't be surprised when he attempts to seize the power to, uh, to carry out that uh, impossible job. And having demanded the impossible, don't be surprised if you're disappointed with the results. Uh, when, when it comes to the presidency, we demand what we cannot have, and as a result, we usually get what we don't much like. Uh, and the result is an office that's a, a constitutional monstrosity. Uh, it's at once menacing and ineffectual. Uh, so my book is called The Cult of the Presidency, but uh, I've often thought I, I should have called it The Futility of Hope. <laughs> I hope you're not here for, uh, you weren't expecting, for me at least, a, uh, a dose of, a ray of sunny optimism about the uh, state of modern presidential politics and the future of our presidency, because if so, man, are you going to be disappointed. Uh, but think about that phrase, the audacity of hope. What, what does it mean? In the uh, 2004 Democratic National Convention speech where Barack Obama uh, debuted the, the, the phrase, uh, it becomes clear, I think, that the audacity of hope is the pro eternal promise of redemption through presidential politics. It's the idea that the president can save us when it comes to the, the whatever, whatever ails us, whether it's unemployment or hurricanes or uh, or divisiveness or, or even spiritual malaise. The president has the cure. He can, uh, as uh, Barack Obama has promised variously during the campaign, end the age of oil in our time and fundamentally transform the economy. Uh, give every American cheap, affordable bro broadband access uh, and, and, and uh, other miracles. As uh, it seems with the, with the presidency, all things are possible. As uh, Barack Obama put it in a speech in South Carolina a while back, with the right kind of leadership, we can, quote, create a kingdom here on earth. Now, I, I hope that doesn't sound partisan, because I, I, if there's one thing I hope I did right with the book is that I made it completely nonpartisan. It's relentlessly cynical about both sides of the uh, political spectrum and both political parties. And the fact is that many of the same conservatives today who uh, criticize the so-called cult of Obama are the very same people who made a flight-suited action figure hero out of George W. Bush. And what the 2008 campaign made clear, I think, is that both major parties subscribe to a messianic view of the presidency. In his keynote address at the, at the GOP convention, Rudolph Giuliani 
uh, it declared that we could, quote, trust John McCain to deal with anything that nature throws our way, anything the terrorists do to us. We will be safe in his hands, and our children will be safe in his hands, because he's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> there's, a, there's a terrific uh, McCain campaign ad. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, it's called The One. Uh, and it, it pokes fun at, at some of uh, Obama's uh, the affectations or pretensions to be some kind of God-touched chosen one. And in the ad, they mix uh, clips of uh, Charlton Heston as Moses with uh, parting the waters with, with, with clips of Obama speeches. But McC McCain was apparently chosen by God as well. In his, uh, before his acceptance speech to the uh, Republican National Convention, they played a biographical video. And in the uh, video, the, the narrator talks about this uh, horrible incident um, uh, this, uh, in 67 uh, when uh, McCain was serving on the USS Forrestal, uh, where this, this missile went off and 134 men were killed, but M McCain survived. And so the narrator tells us 134 men lost their lives, but John McCain's life was somehow spared. Perhaps he had more to do. The suggestion was that God had saved John McCain so that one day he could be president and have his own plane and nuclear weapons. And uh, it was an odd suggestion, I, I thought. Uh, so you get this, you, you listen to uh, the campaigns, you, you get this remarkable view of the president. Uh, he's an anointed figure. He's also America's shrink and our social worker and our national talk show host. He's your buddy and your life coach, and he's also the supreme warlord of the earth. But there's a reason that the candidates talk the way they do. Uh, I think this, is, uh, this is, reflects the way that the, the office has changed. Uh, there, there's a revealing moment in the first presidential debate uh, when moderator Jim Lehrer asked the candidates, uh, asked Obama and McCain, are you willing to admit, both of you, that this financial crisis is going to change the way that you rule the country uh, as president of the United States. And what was revealing is what the candidates didn't say. Neither of them objected to his phrasing or to the, the conception that it is the job of the president of the United States to rule the country. Well, I, needless to say, I think that, that, that couldn't be further from the uh, framers' view. The framers uh, expected Congress to, to take the lead in matters of national policy. Uh, they. they uh, the, the president was a limited constitutional officer. He didn't go around, uh, George Washington didn't go around calling himself everyone's commander in chief. Most often he referred to the, the job as chief magistrate, which is a much more humble term. And he didn't believe that, uh, that uh, the president's powers as commander in chief gave him the authority to violate whatever laws he, he wanted to violate so long as he did it in the name of national security. Uh, the framers, uh, as Professor Toulis can, can tell you, uh, we're uncomfortable with the notion of the president as people's tribune, peop uh, as someone who would, uh, would speak directly to the public and, uh, and use the bully pulpit to move the masses and uh, unite them behind particular policies. Well, th this, this limited, humble view of the presidency looks far different than what we've got today. In the uh, Bush years, as uh, as I'm sure you're aware, we got a very different constitutional view of the, the presidency. You could call it uh, the neo-constitution. Uh, in, in the, in the neo-constitution, unlike the original constitution, the president has, in the words of John Yoo, uh, top official at the Bush uh, Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, the president has the right, the, quote, the right to start wars, and he doesn't need so much as a permission slip from Congress. He has virtually unlimited power to, uh, to tap phones and read email, doesn't need to, to uh, ask a judge for a warrant so long as it's done in the name of national security. And uh, most appallingly that the president, uh, the claim you saw in the Padilla case, that the president can seize an American citizen on American soil, uh, lock him up for the duration of the war on terror, which in other words perhaps forever, without ever having to, uh, to file charges or, or answer to a judge. 